So hello, good afternoon, good morning uh, to everyone to this webinar organized by the Knowledge Rights 21 program. Uh, it's the second part of a two part short series about the flexible copyright exceptions. Our previous edition looked very much at what was going on in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, in countries like that, and in Europe. And this time we're very happy to be looking to the Western Hemisphere and hearing a bit from colleagues in the US. In terms of the goals that we're looking to, the, the goals that we have for this session, we want to learn a bit more about what flexible exceptions to copyright look like in reality, address some of the myths and misinformation that is out there about fair use, and explore the applicability of fair use in Europe. Now, this work is taking place within the context of the Knowledge Rights 21 programme, of which IFLA, and I'm Stephen Weiber, Director of Policy and Advocacy at IFLA, is uh, one of the partner organisations. And um, we very much picked, and Knowledge Rights 21 chose to focus on flexible exceptions because it offers a really interesting, a really powerful way to help ensure that copyright laws can stay up to date, can remain, you could say, even inoculated, vaccinated against the changes that happen in the way we do education, the way we do research, the way we want to access culture. We've seen different approaches in different parts of the world, and the idea of this today's session is to find out more about what it means, how it helps. At the same time, of course, we're conscious that there is a lot of noise, there's a lot of criticism, especially when other countries look to introduce fair use. There's often an accusation that it is just an American idea, that it is something that will lead to calamitous, disastrous results. Um, however, as we saw very much in our previous webinar in the series, actually what's motivated those governments that have introduced fair use has been a desire to support research, not certain, and certainly they haven't seen any sort of disastrous results. As indicated here, what we're looking to do today is hear from people who are working with fair use on a daily basis in the US to try and address, to give an idea of well, what does it mean beyond the hype, beyond the noise, beyond the stories that are often shared in efforts to try and stop it. So in terms of who we have with us, um, I'm very happy to say that we have three excellent colleagues from the US, who, from different parts of the US, who can all share these experiences. First of all, we'll have Sarah Benson, who is a copyright librarian and associate professor at the University of Illinois, Illinois Libraries. Um, she also holds appointments with the School of Information Sciences, the European Union Centre, and the Centre for Global Studies at the University of Illinois. I should also say she is the chair of IFLA's own advisory committee on copyright and related rights. Then we'll be hearing from Melissa Levine, who's the director of the University of Michigan Libraries Copyright Office. Melissa teaches broadly on IP matters, including at the University of Michigan School of Information faculty, as well as for Johns Hopkins University's Masters in Museum Studies. She's also an appointee to the Library of Congress's IT Modernization Committee for the U US Copyright Office, and also serves on IFLA's, my organization's advisory committee on copyright and related rights. She also participates in the Fulbright Specialist Program for International Exchange. Finally, Derek Slater is a founding partner at Proteus Strategies, a tech policy strategy and advocacy consulting firm. He previously helped build Google's public policy team from 2007 to 2022, serving as the global director of information policy over the last three years of that time. He led a global team of subject matter experts on access to information, content regulation, and online safety, and testified before legislators in the US, the UK, and elsewhere around the globe. Before his time at Google, Derek was the activism coordinator for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and the first student fellow at Hartman's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Before asking each of our speakers to talk, I just wanted to give a little bit more background about what Knowledge Rights 21 is as a program, and so you can see a little bit how this work fits in. Overall, what we're looking to do with Knowledge Rights 21 is deal with the fact, with what we see in the way that the European Union and European countries in general design their laws around access to knowledge for research, for education, for culture. Too often these laws are, are conceived, are thought of as exceptions to something else. They're dealt with in a piecemeal way, in a scattered way, in an unsystematic way, which means that too often there are gaps, too often there are delays, too often there are holes, which mean that people are less able than they could be. They're unable 
to use the possibilities that technology brings to exercise and to enjoy their rights to education, science and culture. Through the project also, we want to work more and we want to help librarians and people who work alongside libraries to bring together their experiences. Through this day to day engagement with knowledge, librarians and students and researchers are at the coalface. They see what it is, they see what the problems are in the way that the law allows or does not allow access to and use of information. This experience is valuable and we believe it needs to be heard. And so that's another function of the programme is to try and bring that to the fore, to make sure that these practical experiences are heard and that we find. As part of this, we therefore look, we have an agenda, we have a set of areas where we believe that it should be possible in the short term to try and achieve policy solutions which unlock this change, that prompt this sort of positive change, these positive evolutions in law. In particular, we're very much focused on ebooks and ensuring that and, and ensuring that it's possible for libraries to work with ebooks to fulfill their traditional missions. We work on contract override and the fact that too often possibilities granted to libraries and their users under law can very simply be taken away. We work on secondary publishing rights, the idea that publicly funded research should immediately be open, be published open access under an open license, around rights retention. The idea that instead of signing away all of their rights to publishers, authors should be able to grant a non-exclusive right to the publication, but then retain their rights and publish openly. And of course, the subject of today's webinar on open norms. We offer a number of ways to get involved. I will talk a little bit more about these at the end, but I think right now I would like to hand over the floor to Sara, to the first of our speakers. So over to you, Sara. Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully you can see my slides okay. Um, myself and um, Melissa have shared our slides, so they are in one handy place. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about fair use as it applies to educators, librarians, and researchers. And of course, um, the big disclaimer that this is really, you know, based on my experience in the United States, but hopefully it does serve as a good example for ways in which the law can be friendly to educators, researchers, librarians. And also uh, another disclaimer, which I always give is that none of this is in intended to be legal advice, obviously. <laughs> I, think, I think we all know that, but I'm just letting everyone know. Um, all right, so fair use. Um, you're seeing my next slide now, yes? Yes, okay. Um, fair use is a moving target. It is not a stagnant thing. It is constantly evolving. And of course, in the United States with our system of legal precedent and common law, um, it is always developing. And, and in some ways for researchers, educators, librarians, that can be frustrating. Folks want some bright line rules. Um, in particular, when I teach librarians, um, I see them struggling with the flexible nature of fair use um, and wanting some of those bright line rules in the sand, right? 10% of the work can be used. Uh, this one chapter for classroom use, things like that. Educational use is always a fair use. Those kinds of myths, right, that are we all know are, are not accurate. But I would also suggest that the flexibility of fair use is one of the ways in which it is most powerful. And what I try to do with my students and through webinars such as these is to empower people to understand how flexible it is and then use fair use in a way that they are not um, shrinking from the law and and kind of un feeling that there's fear surrounding it, right? I think that the lack of bright line rules sometimes instills fear in folks. And I try to encourage people not to do that, to, to really view it as something that is a tool 
especially in the work of educating research and librarianship, and to understand that the case-by-case -case nature of the rules allows some flexibility, right? And that, especially in the United States, um, we have what's called 504C2 of the Copyright Act that allows librarians and educators some amount of um, of uh, respite, I guess, from from large statutory damages if they have a reasonable belief that their use was a fair use. And I really do like to start there when I talk to people about fair use because I think sometimes they're afraid to assert fair use for fear of being sued. And so noting that if you have a reasonable good faith belief that your particular use as a librarian, as an educator is a fair use, um, you're going to have some measure of protection. That's a, that's a good place to start, right? To say, okay, let then let's try to engage with it in a reasonable manner, right? I'm not trying to tell people to, you know, extend the law as far as humanly possible or to, you know, assert that everything is a fair use, but to feel that engaging with fair use is something they can do. And in fact, it's something we all do and we have all been doing. Um, I like to point out also that, you know, even at, in sixth grade and grade school, you know, we often used large quotations in our papers, right? And and did so without permission from the publisher of the book uh, and knowing that we can, but understanding that could do so because of fair use is something that kind of lights a light bulb, right? It says, oh, I've been exercising fair use. I just didn't know what it was. And kind of letting folks know, this is something we do uh, daily and we don't necessarily even know we're doing it. When we retweet something, when we post a meme, when we create something from something else, we do this all the time. And then kind of going from there and saying, okay, how can we do this in our work and still feel comfortable because we do it in our personal lives and we feel quite comfortable. Um, so as I mentioned, fair use develops over time. It develops through court decisions in the United States. And, you know, one of the first decisions that decided what is transformative fair use, which has really pushed the needle quite a bit for researchers and educators and librarians, is from Campbell versus Akoff Rose Music, 1994. So it's quite old at this point. Um, and the court the Supreme Court told us that a transformative fair use is one that adds something new to the original work and comments on the new work with a new meaning or message. And so we use this quite often in research by commenting on something. And sometimes we even have to use the whole image or the whole whatever the work is, right, to comment on it in a new way. And that has really allowed us to push fair use much further. And that came from the Supreme Court in 1994. Again, quite an old decision, but has then impacted research and education for years to come. Um, interestingly, as we speak today, the Supreme Court is, is considering this very thing, is considering transformative fair use. And we don't yet have that decision. And the question looms large, for me at least, how will this impact the future of transformative fair use in particular in the United States? Um, so the case is Warhol versus Goldsmith. Um, they're wrestling with Andy Warhol's use of Goldsmith's photographs of prints um, to make silk screened art and whether that was transformative. It, it's a very open question how much this could impact researchers, educators, librarians. And it very much depends on what the Supreme Court says, right? Um, obviously, if they limit their comments to a very specific case and very specific facts, then it won't have as big of an impact. But 
usually if the Supreme Court says something about fair use, it's going to have an impact on, on all of us. And so um, I encourage you, and I'm certainly going to be waiting with bated breath for this decision, but I encourage you to keep an eye on it um, if you're interested in, in fair use in the United States, because I think that it's going to have a very big impact. I mean, as you saw with the last case from 1994, that has really shaped fair use in the United States since since that time. And now we have a new case coming out. So it is not decided yet. We've had the oral arguments, but um, I had a hard time gleaning where the court was going from that. Um, sometimes you can tell from listening to the oral arguments which way they're leaning, but I thought it was pretty hard to tell where, where they're going. I, I had a hard time reading the tea leaves, reading the room. Um, I, I, I'd be interested if other panelists have another perspective, but I think it's going to be something we need to keep an eye on. But what has happened between 1994, that first Supreme Court decision on transformative fair use, and today, where we have this case pending? A lot, <laughs> a lot has happened. And this is why I'm like, hmm, what's the Supreme Court going to do? Because a lot of these things that have happened have been lower court cases, right? So we have researchers relying on fair use for text and data mining quite securely because of the HathiTrust case in the Second Circuit. Um, and, and that case really said that using um, term numbers for research is a quintessentially fair use, quintessentially transformative fair use. And so we've been pretty secure in our um, use of copyright protected works for text and data mining under that. Um, how will this new decision impact that? Will it impact it at all? Um, educators have been relying on fair use for teaching and using portions of works for e-reserves. There was a big case that lasted about 12 years um, in Georgia State University, Cambridge University Press versus Patent, 11th Circuit. Um, and largely the court found that most uses were fair uses. Um, that case was not necessarily a transformative fair use case, but involved actual just regular old fair use, right? Just copying portions for educational uses, um, but still has shaped uh, the way that we think about um, how we copy things, right? And so, and one one factor that was raised in that case was, you know, is there some sort of license for the work? We should check and see if there's a license available. And if so, maybe that changes our fair use analysis a bit. Um, and then, you know, we have librarians relying on fair use for electronic exhibitions, um, for library guides, for making works available to patrons under the ARL Code of Best Practices and Fair Use, which isn't a court decision, but based on kind of our common understandings of fair use and is quite a nice guide for other librarians who are wishing to make works available. There are other cases, of course, I, I'm thinking specifically of the Van Halen exhibit from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where fair use was held, um, transformative fair use uh, showing a photo in a, in a museum exhibit um, of the guitar that was focused more on the guitar than the player. Um, and so there are other also cases that have been helping us to make the argument of transformative fair use there. And again, you know, how does this Supreme Court pending decision impact that analysis? And that is something we are going to have to wait and see. I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court is not going to walk back all of the progress that we've made over the this last amount of time between 1994 and 2023. I'm hopeful, and I'm also hopeful based on their last decision that was a Google case, um, and they held that an API use was fair use um, based on functionality and things like that. I'm hopeful based on that case. I'm hopeful based on just all of the progress that we've made. And again, that the Supreme Court notices and understands how much fair use pushes progress, right? We can progress in our research. We can progress 
in our education, we can progress as a society because we allow for these fair uses. So hopefully um, the Supreme Court doesn't walk back all of that progress. Um, so where are we headed? Uh, well, first of all, I, I'm not sure with the Supreme Court case. Like I said, I don't, I don't know exactly, but one thing that has been on a lot of people's mind is controlled digital lending. And specifically, the Internet Archive case that was just um, rendered a su summary judgment. Now, I would agree with my colleague, Lisa Hinchliffe, who wrote recently in uh, The Scholarly Kitchen, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> That's what she, <laughs> quoting her. <laughs> I, I agree, because the reality is, first of all, this was a lower court decision. It's on appeal. That's one. Two, not every case is the Internet Archive case, right? I, I, I'll say another quote that we say in the U.S. a lot, bad facts make bad law. And I know I can take some criticism for this, for saying it's bad facts, but really what the Internet Archive was doing, in my opinion, is not controlled in any way. Uh, it was digital lending, but I'm not sure, that, in my opinion, that it was very controlled. And I think that is where they brought on the litigation. And I think there are other cases and instances where libraries and librarians are engaging in controlled digital lending that is much more justifiable under fair use. So again, I would say keep calm and carry on and, and keep, we'll, we'll follow the lawsuit, of course, but I think, you know, we might be able to distinguish factually between different cases of controlled digital lending. Um, the other area that is developing is artificial intelligence and copyright. And where is that headed? Um, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I think, um, Everyone's struggling with that, and including the U.S. Copyright Office that has an ongoing study. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting area, right, because there's a lot of research going on in this area. And then the question is, you know, who owns the copyright, if anyone? Is there infringement going on in all of the scraping and the data collection? And um, what, what, if any, limits are there? And I think that's going to be a continuing developing area. And I think it really does impact our researchers and it really does impact our creators as well, right? So it is something that we need to keep an eye on. Um, and I, I'm following it as much as everyone else um, in terms of, you know, do I have all the answers? Nope, I do not. Um, but I think, I think, very few people do. I think at this point it's so it's so new and it's developing to the point that we need to just keep on following the cases as they develop and follow the policy guidance as it develops. Um, I do what I've seen so far from the Copyright Office is that if it's really computer generated output, that's not necessarily owned by any author. So that might be some way that it's headed, um, but things could change. So I think it's in a place that we should keep following. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Melissa. What's the expression? Change is the only consistent. I can't remember the expression. Constant. Change is the only constant. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you for um, having us um, to talk about this topic. And um, uh, I have, I think, six slides. And then I just wanted to talk, can I share my screen for a moment at the end? Do I have yes. that? Okay, good. I just wanted to share something for fun. So first, I just wanted to share some thoughts about fair use and copies. Um, first, I completely agree with everything Sarah said. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the ways in which Many librarians want checklists or they want uh, a rule that they can apply in a way that feels very efficient to them is very understandable. But I think that um, it tends to undermine the legitimate application of fair use as an equitable tool to make uh, decisions that the law is designed for normal people to make reasonable decisions about um, the way they quote. And I really love Sarah's example of like the second grade, the papers that we write when we're eight years old um 
that are by an academic standard, completely plagiarized, but it's part of the learning of how to be a writer and how to express this way. Um, I want to back up just really quickly to define what fair use is. Um, Sarah talked a lot about the cases and the way case law and particular facts patterns define um, how we approach what is or may not be fair use, but it's um, a section of our Federal Copyright Act um, before the, our 1976 Act, which was the last really major overhaul, um, fair use was uh, something that was actually part of the case law that, that Sarah was describing. Um, and there was not a, a, a single cohesive set of copyright law for the United States. There was a federal act, but there were also state laws. So that 76 Act did a really important job in making a cohesive set of laws for the United States, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but what they did is they looked at all, like the last hundred years of cases and where the fact patterns played out and said, okay, for these kinds of important socially favored purposes, we want uh, people to be able to make certain kinds of uses because otherwise you would have an, a monopoly on speech or a monopoly on expression. And uh, the way it's expressed in our copyright law is notwithstanding the section of the law that just defines the rights of copyright holders. So e e e this is something that's carved out from the beginning of the creation of the work that the public has these, these kinds of um, uh, rights to use and reuse materials in a way that um, should not interfere with say the commercial interests of, 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 a, of a rights holder. It might though. Um, notwithstanding their monopoly on all the things that come with their creation, there are some things that are carved out for the public's use and, and needs right from the get-go. And you're familiar with the kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, the statute says uh, you can make reproduction of copies or phono records um, for criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, uh, including multiple copies for the classroom, scholarship and research, and that these are these uses under certain circumstances are not an infringement. And this list is not uh, a limiting list. It's a start from here and uh, it, it leaves the leeway to ask these questions about things like artificial intelligence um, and whatever new technology we're dealing with at any given moment. And then it looks at four factors. You've heard that expression, um, uh, the nature of the work, for the purpose, the use, the nature of the work, uh, the amount used in, uh, in, in the substantiality in comparison with the whole work, um, and the effect on the potential market. And people tend to, to focus very heavily on the market harm element, which is really important, but it isn't determinative by itself. There are commercial um, examples where fair use was found. Um, uh, what I, for me, my thesis for this talk is that fair use for me, as, as uh, somebody practicing in the United States, is that fair use is normal. It's, um, it's not, uh, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's a normal reaction here. And I don't know whether the law follows the behavior, the behavior follows the law in this case. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so I wanna give you some, a, a few very, very basic day-to-day -day kinds of examples of things I don't worry about. So if I'm working in a library, I've worked in a big research library for a number of years, but I've worked in museums and, and other large libraries in the past. If somebody has a question about making what a preservation copy, what, however we define that, um, if a professional colleague who's dealing with materials thinks that a facsimile is needed because say the wear and tear on an original um, is, is destroying it or maybe it's essentially destroyed and you need to make that copy. Um, in addition to some additional rights as for libraries and archives that we also have in the Copyright Act, just as a common sense matter, 107 does a lot of work, that fair use statute does a lot of work in making me say, make the preservation copy. Like it is just um, contrary to my sense of common sense to say, no, I'm worried there's not, there's not a, a, a specific um, uh, rule that allows me to do this. 
um, just having collections deteriorate and destroyed so that they're not useful for anybody is really contrary to mission and my, my, my own sensibilities. And this applies to any media. Um, we don't need to license preservation kinds of, of copies, those kinds of things. Um, it's a very practical problem and, it's, and, the, and I don't even think twice about it. And I know my colleagues in other parts of the world do. The other piece to this is access because access, um, as you all know, is sort of goes hand in glove in most cases with preservation. Um, we handle this in lots of different ways and we make different kinds of um, choices about levels of access. So if you've got a preservation copy and there's a reason it has to be used or experienced at a particular physical location, fine. If you can make it available, remotely to people in other places to facilitate their research and education, all the better. And that has very much become a normal, a normed activity in the, since the 90s, really in the time frame that Sarah was pointing out in, um, in her slide about the cases that have been coming up. And uh, one of the most familiar ways is, is in the ways that museum, particularly libraries and museums to, and to a degree uh, archives, digitize collections and make them available at different uh, at different levels of extent. And uh, I'm providing a link here to the uh, roughly 200 collections that the University of Michigan Library has online. They've been doing this work since the, er since the early mid nineties. Um, and it covers a huge range of material. And if you look through the collections, some of them are available openly for anyone to look at and access, and in some cases download elements. Um, and in some cases, there, uh, um, you, ha you would have to log in as an accredited University of Michigan user to access those collections. So we make sort of calibrated decisions about um, levels of access for these university collections, depending on our sense of um, what's appropriate. I'm hoping this summer to do a review of the, these 200 collections to see um, whether we're too conservative, not conservative enough, consistent, and just see what our own patterns are this, this, um, uh, this summer is my hope. Um, I should mention, I saw Jody Bailey is on this call. Jody is our counterpart at Emory University. And she's just, um, she's one of several authors of a, um, a book, a toolkit called Finding Balanced Collaborative Workflows for Risk Management in Sharing Cultural Heritage. Uh, collections online. So that's a resource I would um, commend to you. Uh, next slide. So we have preservation, we have res uh, uh, access, and what are these for? Well, partly they're for research and scholarship. So here at the University of Michigan, like many universities, we have um, our, our repositories. Uh, uh, our branding is deep blue, um, and uh, our school colors are uh, blue and maize, yellow, it's a really yellow. Um, so they, they thought that calling it deep blue was very witty. Um, uh, so we, for many years, had a repository for documents. So faculty can upload uh, their preprints, published versions, they can put in slide decks, you know, really anything with that they consider their scholarly output. Um, but in the last few years, we've started a data repository as well. So there's deep blue documents and deep blue data. And the data sets that we particularly um, are responsible for are open data sets. We don't handle in our service things that need to be closed or may have um, privacy issues or proprietary issues. And there's other ways of handling those. Um, so particularly for dissertations, um, uh, I do not worry about, say, images that are included in dissertations when they're relevant, just like any other evaluation, when those images are used for the purpose of, of illustrating or expressing something that's core to whatever's being documented or, or, or argued in a dissertation. Um, I do talk with graduate students frequently. They worry about these things. There's a lot of sort of um, copyright myth that causes a lot of anxiety, even for things that are, are, can be handled. Um, I find in certain disciplines, uh, there are permissions that are sort of culturally ex except expected vis-a-vis um, -vis collections that people work with, but that's, a, that's different from the copyright component. 
So the equivalent of a thumbnail of a painting, a reference image that may be uh, in black and white or gray tone uh, in a dissertation doesn't, does, it's not, not one of the things that is, um, it doesn't keep me up at night. Um, we've also had a lot of conversations around three-dimensional scans of objects. And this is a newer area, which could be a 3D scan of uh, the bones of a mammoth uh, or a dinosaur or a piece of sculpture. It could be 3D scans of archeological sites, to, um, especially in fragile or war-torn uh, situations where buildings are being destroyed. Um, or for study more deeply, there's a fascinating um, project involving Pompeii. Um, and uh, to that end, I had participated with a group of people on producing a, let me get the exact name for you. It's called 3D Data Creation to Curation. And I'll, give, I'll provide these resources to the organizers, Community Standards for 3D Data Preservation. So it's, it's uh, it deals with many aspects of um, 3D data preservation geared towards, written by and geared towards the, sort of the cultural heritage community. And there is a chapter specifically about copyright. Oh, thank you, Jody. Um, uh, Jody put a link uh, in the um, chat. Um, there's both uh, a, a lovely print copy if you would like to spend 90 or so dollars on that. Um, uh, but there's also a very good, uh, the exact same open access quality. Uh, Copy. Um, okay, next slide. The other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is we're going to, from sort of like the really everyday to like more complex kinds of fair uses is the Hathi Trust Research uh, Center analytics, analytics tools. And um, I'm making the assumption that you're familiar with Hathi Trust and, and what it is generally. Um, it's a partnership primarily of North American research libraries, but there are several that are outside the United States um, and Canada. Um, that is really the fruit of, uh, at, its, at, its, at its outset of the Google Library Scanning Project. So the scans that um, were generated from the partnerships that a number of libraries had with Google to scan their collections, um, in many cases, a part of the arrangement with Google was that those individual libraries were able to retain or receive a set of their scans. And those, um, many if not all of those libraries chose to work together to, to form a single partnership that allows for digital preservation and access where either we have permission uh, to make something available or we've identified something as being in the public domain so those are what we would call, like when you're reading and looking at an individual work that people refer to that as a consumptive use because you're using the work in the way it was designed. Um, but then there are things that we refer to as non-consumptive uses, which is, uh, way, which is looking at, in this case, the collection as a data set and thinking about different ways that you can interact with that information to, come, to, do, to explore all kinds of different things. So I, at this point, the, the most recent stats I was able to find um, indicates that there's actually 16 and a half million volumes, over 400 la la languages. Um, you can look online, there's like some lovely pie charts for uh, that let you play around to see what different allocations of, of what's represented in there. Um, the vast majority is in English because again, these are North American um, collections, but there's a significant number in German um, which I think I would speculate repre represents the significance of German uh, research output in the sciences and in the arts, excuse me, through the 19th century and, and so on. And then it goes on down to some very tiny percentages in other languages. Um, one of the interesting things is that the allocation is that um, three quarters of the works were published between 1900 and 1909 about 10% were published from 2000 to present. And then the other remainder, um, which really runs from 1700 to 1899, it's a total of about 16%, uh, where I'm going to assume for this conversation or in the, is in the public domain. So the public domain is another discussion, um, but it's one of those other corollaries to fair use in the sense that it is a limit on the scope and scale of copyright. Um, 
so anyway, the HathiTrust Research Center is possible because we have HathiTrust as a, this collection of, of materials. Um, so the analytics are tools, we can look at the next slide, um, that allow, I mean, you, you can log in as a, a general user, uh, you can contact the, the research center for other kinds of rights and, 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 and opportunities to use the materials for non-consumptive uses. But there were three um, kinds of uh, tools that are included on the website right now. One is, uh, they refer to them as extracted features. So these are um, unrestricted sets of metadata and things like word counts um, that, uh, that you can look at for, for um, a particular query. Um, you can download them um, and you can explore them on your own. Uh, uh, next slide. The other two that I wanted to mention were text analysis algorithms and data capsules. So uh, the text analysis algorithms um, are, uh, uh, even I can use them, and that's saying something because despite, despite my talking about really complicated things, I know my category of complicated things, not all the actual mechanics of doing some of these things. Um, the text analysis allows you to do um, computational analysis over the corpus of text. Um, and one of the things that Hati lets anyone do is create with a, a collection, meaning you can go through the Hati trust, you can create an account, you can identify things that you wanna look at almost like uh, bookmarking in a, uh, in a browser. Um, and you can make that collection public if you want or not public. And this is a great way of like facilitating your own research or your own curiosity and possibly sharing with others. Um, Data, uh, data capsules um, are more involved. They're secure virtual environments that allow for non-consumptive text analysis. Um, and I think I've exhausted my technical capacity there, but I did want uh, for, for the sake of example, and I know we need to get to Derek um, to show you like, a, if you haven't played around with these tools, let me try and share my screen. I'm gonna share my screen, Rachel. Um, here we go. All right, can you see my screen at this point? Did Not yet. Me? Okay, let me see if I can press the button. Helps if I say share. Is that better? It's sharing, here we go, we've got it. Okay, so this is the cover, the 3D standards uh, product, product. But what I wanted to show you is with the, one of the tools that I just mentioned um, that this is freely available online and it is significantly reliant on fair use. I should have mentioned that really the Google Library Project and thus Hathi are all uh, very much courtesy of fair use um, is this bookworm tool, which is, I find it, it allows you to search just one word, not multiple words in a query um, over the whole corpus. So if you look up the word earth in this case, you get this chart that shows you the pattern of frequency of the word earth, um, which peaks at what, 1848 and really just declines significantly in the 2000s. But then I play around and I say, okay, earthquake. And I add on and So it's fairly low for most of the history. It pops up in the, or the 1960s and then really ramps up in the 80s. So you sort of, I question what that's about. Um, Another thing, polka. So I think of the dance, the polka, not a lot until you hit the, the, the mid-1800s. Um, and then it precipitously drops off because I don't know how many people are doing the polka or writing about the polka. However, if you say polka dot, um, you get a completely different pattern. And that tells you, I'm not sure what it tells you, but it tells you something. Um, here's heart, just like heart. Um, it tells you one set of pattern. Uh, I find it interesting that it really declines uh, through the 1900s. And I tried heartbreak, which sadly increases immensely uh, over, the, over the 1900s. And then I tried heartburn, which also, alas, increases significantly. Um, 
for the because of the, our, our audience for this conversation, I looked up the word Europe. I couldn't do. I know people have done searches on patterns of America and the United States of America and the the patterns with regard to when this language indicates when uh, the United States started to pe perceive themselves as uh, truly as, as a country, as one country. Um, and Europe, not quite as much variation. So that's kind of interesting. So um, I'm going to unshare. And I hope, thank you for, for accommodating my, my little show and tell. And I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Derek. Sure, thanks, that was a great slides and show and tell. It's great to see those tools uh, in action. Uh, thanks all, thanks Stephen uh, uh, and Ben for having me as well. Again, my name is Derek Slater. I uh, run a consulting firm called Proteus Strategies. Um, my intro was sort of given from most recent, uh, but I wanna start like way back and why am I here? I got interested in copyright 25 years ago now as a teenager um, around the time of digital music starting to come up. And really that point of looking at this from a fan's perspective, you could say it from a consumer's perspective or a user's perspective, but really I, you know, I love music, I love video. Um, I'm not great at art myself, but I like playing around and trying to create stuff myself when I can. And it's that, that sort of perspective that carried forward into my career focusing on copyright and particularly on fair use, um, both at ESF, EFF as a really, you know, where as a user rights act advocate um, and focusing on things from that perspective um, and, where, and where and how fair use could help enable individuals, people to make new uses of works through new technologies. Um, and that's part of what brought me to um, Google. I mean, it's a uh, you know, different world now in the technology sectors today, but if you travel back in time to 2007, before there were Android phones, um, Google Books, YouTube, uh, there were still you know, lawsuits against search just for indexing and caching that we were dealing with. And so I'm going to be at the center of that storm it's part of what brought me to Google and what I worked on for uh, quite some time, both um, with respect to the US and fair use, but um, engaged with the EU copyright directive um, and copyright issues in South Africa, Israel, Singapore, around the world, and got the sense of how many, how different regimes shape very different outcomes. Um, and so I'll sort of today, I just want to sort of tick through from that journey. Um, I was, you know, sort of traveling back in time myself and thinking about what are sort of the key things that fair use has enabled? Um, I think if you heard today, you know, the hard thing about fair use is that it's case by case. It doesn't give you a clear answer. Um, and in that way, it is only a complement to bright line exceptions. On the other hand, the great thing about fair use is that it's case by case. It can evolve with time as new types of uses, new types of technology that allows new types of uses um, evolve and thus, um, can also help sort of create the space for people to think of and reimagine how we create um, in ways that, and, and engage with media in ways that I think are really important, both socially and uh, economically. And I think that's part of where we've seen, you know, lots of new interesting innovations come out of places where there is, um, where there is fair use and then over time move to other jurisdictions. But a lot of the major consumer electronics and internet services that have relied on fair, that have grown up, have relied on fair use first started here, uh, then gone elsewhere. Um, and you know, the sort of approach as um, was said at the beginning, is no longer just an American one and that you can look at um, countries like Israel or even, you know, sort of through its you know, expansion in the courts, the fair dealing in Canada, um, or places like Singapore that have had more expansive uh, exceptions regimes. But sort of tra you know, traveling through time and thinking about the buckets where of concrete user benefits um, that fair use has enabled, um, you know, I, come, I sort of start from a different perspective than I think what we heard before. My first interaction was really around personal use copying. Um, so you know, this goes back in the US to the Sony, versus, uh, the, the Sony Betamax case um, but Sony versus Universal, um, where the VCR, it's used for time shifting was held to be fair use and Sony 
as the distributor of and creator of that um, that product was not held liable for its potentially infringing uses because it was capable of substantial non-infringing uses. Um, those those twin parts, both the fair use ruling and then that secondary liability ruling about Sony, I think unleashed a huge wave of both um, innovation, consumer benefit, and creativity, because you know the VCR, the MP3 player, all these sort of personal use copying devices that evolved, uh, particularly as things moved to digital, certainly were great for consumers and being able to time shift, so watch their stuff later. Uh, space shift have sort of portability of moving something from a CD to an MP3 that they could listen to on their iPod and so on. But you know these were also complementary goods for um, for creators at the end of the day. That is, um, they expanded they expanded markets for how to reach, find, and make money um, from works. Right, the VCR created a whole new. Um, rental market, sort of hard to think back to that world before Netflix and Hulu and whatnot. Um, but it, it did, it expanded those markets. Same thing happened with um, the iPod and, and other sorts of devices. And I think what's interesting there is, um, you know, in part because it's 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 been enclosed, pe people, uh, you know, wondered at the time, well, why not, if it's so complimentary, why not let this just be licensed? Um, and I still go back to a paper that my former colleague, Fred von Lohmann, um, wrote called Fair Use is Innovation Policy, where, you know, he looked at, um, you know, not just sort of theory of economics and how things should work, but how do things play out on the ground looking at business literature? Um, and one of the things you see in the literature is that time and again, incumbents would not think of these complementary goods as worth investing in because, at the beginnings, they're sort of small and insignificant revenue streams. They're not as good quality. Like the MP3 was worse audio quality than your CD or your record, right? And it was a tiny market. Um, it wasn't, you know, not many people had it. So incumbents generally don't look at it. And in fact, sometimes they think of it as something that's going to be, that's going to cannibalize existing market streams. And so they sort of shunt it away. So only by having this release valve through fair use can you both allow the innovation and allow the consumer benefit? You know, the other criticism was also, well, aren't these technology companies then reaping all these unfair rewards from it? And you look at those markets and, you know, the answer is generally not in that they, those were all commodity markets, right? Like the price by economic theory, marginal revenue, marginal costs, they end up aligning and the technology creators aren't getting it. The surplus is going to consumers, to users. Um, and that's the other role that fair use uh, had. It's really interesting to think about comparing this to what happened with the DVD market where um, the release valve of fair use was cut off through um, in the US section 1201, the anti-circumvention provisions uh, of the DMCA where you didn't end up, you know, you could buy a DVD player but you couldn't back up your DVD. In fact, the people who made that software were sued out of existence. You couldn't you know, make a portable copy that you carried with you on your laptop because um, fair use was trod over by those anti-circumvention regimes. And so you had a much more closed, stultified market where the, where rights holders got to dictate, you know, the sorts of devices and services that interoperated with the media that you had lawful access to. And thus we had, um, you know, much more controlled and limited ways of accessing it. We, you know, have moved to Netflix and so on, but still there's a limited amount of sort of interoperability and thus innovation in secondary complementary markets. Um, you know, with that, I think that, you know, the other piece that sort of stands out in my mind of the legacy of fair use and user rights over many years is around interoperability. You know, the Oracle, the Google case was already mentioned, but if you travel, you know, 20 years back, um, the cases between Sega and Accolade, where Accolade was trying to create video games that interoperated with the Sega uh, Genesis system, or Sony versus Connectix trying to create an interoperable version of the PlayStation software. Um, those two are about, you know, they're cases that involve technology companies but very much are about user rights um, by way of what sorts of media they get to consume and how they consume it and whether they are locked in to a given set of hardware 
uh, or devices to engage the media that they have lawfully acquired or, or accessed. Um, and again, I think of that from the user side as well as from the side of innovators where it creates that breathing space to think expansively about what is possible um, rather than just being locked into to what is. Um, you know, finally then moving sort of into the, the internet realm, I think where we where we slash I have lived for the last 20 years, um, of course, there's been, you know, copying that leads to various sorts of transformative uses that have enabled um, internet services, whether that's search and in an early case here in the US of Kelly v. Arebasoft that was about an image search index that made thumbnails where that was found to be fair use. Um, I think it's interesting to remember here in the context of search um, and then the context of caching in the field v. Google case that dealt with um, the ability of Google to cache websites. Um, the fair use analysis, you know, they both looked at an implied license. This has been made public for anybody to crawl. But in terms of the fair use analysis, I believe they also looked at the fact that Google was acting as a good faith actor by respecting robots.txt. Now, I wouldn't say that robots.txt is something that everybody to be a fair user, user has to comply with. I think a library or research institution might have a very good argument to say, we are crawling the whole web regardless because we are an archival. That's what we do. We archive. Um, and one of the great things about fair use is it can draw those sorts of distinctions. Um, but it's interesting that those sort of voluntary mechanisms, as they have evolved, the law has co-evolved as well. Um, and that, that sort of conversation, I think, can lead to better outcomes over time. Um, you know, I don't think it was explicit, if I recall correctly, in the Google Books case, but Google Books also had um, an opt-out mechanism. And again, I don't think that's necessarily required to do what they were doing. Certainly, you know, for Hathi Trust, I don't think it would necessarily be required. But it is, it's important to recognize there's that dynamic always between the law, norms, market mechanisms, and the technologies all fitting together. Um, and fair use allows, creates a space to have that broader conversation um, and allow those new uses to come about. Uh, finally, you know, we've already mentioned multiple times, uh, but generative AI, I mean, my friends and I who have worked in this uh, in copyright are like, wow, copyright's cool again. <laughs> Good, our, our skills are useful, um, at least in the technology sector. Um, good luck, you know, it seemed like, okay, that was yesterday's thing. Now it's social media and other sorts of topics. Um, I, I have very nerdy friends, uh, as you can tell, but in a good way. But Gen AI has been uh, fascinating to get back into in part because it replays so many of the same dynamics. Um, and in and, and, and that way sort of, to me, calls out the same worries or motivations. So far, a lot of the generative AI debate, that is AI that is used to generate new text, code, images, video, and so audio, has been positioned as big technology companies training on artist works. So it's technology versus artists. And the voice of the user of the technology is sort of erased and shunted to the side. And that's particularly unfortunate here, given how, that in this context, the users are creators, right? They can be artists themselves in many different contexts. And sometimes people are just using it, um, you know, sort of as a quasi search tool or to get answers, that sort of thing. Some of the uses are not that highly creative. I use like ChatGPT to do citations. I'll take a URL and say, give me this in the Chicago style citation. And it gets it 85% right. Um, but there's much more creative uses, right? If you've played around with the image generators or text generators or, or any of that stuff, you can do some pretty interesting stuff. And um, both from the perspective of the professional arts, I think that's interesting, but also sort of um, the, the blurry lines between professional and amateur. I think it's really interesting and important to think about the ability of everybody to sort of have this new superpower to create an image. It might, it's not the same craft as being an artist that can draw or use Photoshop very well. I wouldn't say a prompt engineer is quite like that, um, but still interesting that people can have that superpower. And at the very least, we ought to take those people into account as we think about the fair use analysis and the, the copyright analysis more broadly. It's also a case that in many, you know, many times in the past, types of art that have been disregarded as low art, low quality, just amateur, have evolved over time. 
to become really important forms of communication. And I don't think this time is necessarily um, any different. So I think, you know, my hope as this, as the debate goes forward is that that user rights perspective um, becomes more front and center in the generative AI discussion um, for what it's worth, since we're, uh, I've seen links shared in the chat, um, wrote a brief article about that this week, just citing a few examples. I'd also point out for people who want to go real deep, um, you know, I cite to Mark Lemley and Brian Casey's work on fair use and fair learning um, in, the, in that piece. Lemley and a group of computer scientists have also just published a piece that goes into the um, fair use analysis, but also technical mitigation strategies to deal with the sort of infringement concerns around generative AI. And again, they, they talk very explicitly about how there should sort of be this dialogue between mitigation strategies and the law rather than a one size fits all. Everything is fair use or nothing is fair use. That would be unfortunate. We can actually have a more fact specific um, discussion and hopefully the space can evolve in ways that you know, VCRs and the MP3 player market and so on and so forth uh, evolved in the past. So I'll leave it there, but happy to take other questions or share thoughts. Thank you so much to everyone. It was a, it's really appreciate how you actually made all of your, your interventions fit, fit together. And I, I also really like the fact that at the end, you just bring back to this point of this, the fact that I know, reality is complicated, reality evolves we need to be able to sort of engage with the law and think about and apply it on a case by case basis. And it's neither necessarily desirable or realistic to claim that things are fixed and everything is, is, is as black and white as is claimed. So um, we have obviously the questions and answers button and I very much encourage um, our participants uh, to ask your questions via the Q and A button. I, I, I was sort of trying to work out how I was going to summarise everything that was said just to give people a bit of time to, to think and hopefully I'll say something really dumb uh, so that someone reacts to it. I find that's always a good way to start a conversation by provoking people with idiocy. But um, you know, I, I felt that sort of four words came out from here. I, I think the first one was was worry which sort of featured very much in, in Melissa's point, and that especially when it comes to um, librarians, but also actually consumers for the most part, there is a big fear about getting into trouble uh, and that people don't want to have, people ideally don't want to live in a situation where they need to be scared about, well, if I do this thing that is part of my job and I do have a mandate to do or appears to make sense to me, um, I could nonetheless get into trouble. And so th th this value of fair use as an opportunity, I apologize, but my internet connection isn't as good as that, so I will not speak a little bit slower. Um, that um, the, the, there's this risk, there is this, this, this worry about getting into trouble. And so the value of fair use as a way of actually addressing this, as a way of responding to things that change. But I think also the fact that this same worry means that a fair use when it's applied properly is applied um, is applied carefully. Um, I think that that's a particular sort of key point. And I know there's a lot of discourse out there that equates, and this is the same discourse that equates libraries and, and, and fair use with libraries and exceptions and limitations with piracy in general, which is, is bogus, but it gets used. But, in reality, when fair use is used properly, it is applied carefully. It's applied with consideration. So I think that, that first point about worry and, and the impacts that has, I think Derek's points in particular about dynamism, that too often, and it's a very human characteristic to try and simplify things down to the absolute bare essentials and, and, and think about things in sort of Cartesian dualities as black and white and so on. But the idea of fair use as being a way of actually considering the different actors in play. So not just the sort of big tech versus big content um, punch and Judy show that it often looks like, but having it as a way where we also consider the interests of not just existing creators, but future creators or, ana or amateur create creators or consumers in general. So that opportunity that it provides to actually recognize the reality of, of the dynamism of, of, of what we're dealing with. Um, a third word I, I had down, which I know, came from both Sarah and Melissa, was the fact that fair use has sort of demonstrated time and time again that 
it's a great way of allowing normal stuff to happen that a lot of these discussions a lot of these decisions that have been made in the past maybe they were controversial at the time but they have stood the test of time and that i don't know it's just a, the, the betamax case is obviously the example that gets used most but um the fact that you know, we end up with this looking like common sense and it become, they become business models, they become ways of doing things. So again, that we're not talking about anything extreme or weird or freakish here. It, it, it's a good recipe for actually ensuring that, that our laws end up applying normally to normal situations, which may not be a given otherwise. And then I think finally, come back to one of D D Derek's points, um, the contribution that this makes to competitiveness and then you cited Fred van Lohman's work about fair use as an economic policy and I think this also brings us back to one of the themes in, in, in this that one of the key themes of this webinar as a whole the idea that um, it is a way to actually start new ideas going it's a way of preventing the the, the fossilization the ossification of, of, of markets by allowing incomers to by allowing income newcomers to come into markets by allowing new ideas to to bubble up to the surface and I think that the point was made that one of the reasons maybe why we don't have major European digital superpowers is because the, the way that Europe has tended to work with a, a more rigid approach to copyright has actually held this back um so I know that M Melissa has, uh, I think Melissa's indicated that she's got um, one question. We've got one question in the chat, which is about if there's anything about reviewing, how do we access the recording? We'll put the recording up onto our site. I guess I, I was going to throw in a first question to, 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 to each of our speakers and uh, to, to our speakers as a whole. And I, I, I guess I don't know, this, this, this is a, an entirely predictable, easy question, but to what extent, I don't know, given, given the experience in the US, I mean, if fair use was not there, could you see any of the sort of examples that you've talked about actually taking place? I don't know, would we be in the situation that we are now if there hadn't been fair use? Um, maybe we'll start with Sarah. Well, I think that um, I'm going to give the legal answer, which is it depends because you could have something where it's just, you know, piecemeal, right? Trying to balance creators' rights against the rights of the public. And you could also have um, something that a different statute that maybe isn't isn't the fair use that we know, but more of like a list of different things that people can do. And I've seen that in other countries, right? I actually think fair use the way that it's written in the US and the way that it's flexible is a better approach because it allows for us to do all the innovative things that we've done. So potentially not based on, you know, the fact that without it, if you had nothing in terms of, you know, a limitation on the rights of the owners, similar to fair use, I think definitely not. You could have some sort of carve outs that are more specific, but I think that it would not lend itself to as much creativity as we have and as has developed over time. And I, I, I appreciated Derek's point about AI, right? In terms of it's not only the creators of the artwork, for instance, from Mid Journey who are using this for creative purposes. The people who are actually creating new art through the AI are also creators. And I mean, this is the whole, I mean, we all, we all stand on the shoulder of giants, right? We don't, we don't create something from nothing. And I think fair use is one of those things that really justifies that building upon the use of others. So um, my answer is probably not, but who knows? <laughs> Counterfactuals deserve answers like that. So that's, that's fair. <laughs> Melissa? So first, when you were speaking, I thought you said WALL-E, like the movie, as opposed to worry. And I was like, did I, I mean, I suppose that could be relevant, but that was just 
I, 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 I have a very soft R. I'm sorry. I, I struggle in countries with hard R's. It's, it's, I'm, I'm often, it's an accusation when it's said that I'm soft spoken, but hence the mic. Um, I absolutely think that fair use is um, implicitly or explicit, explicitly an economic policy. Um, I think that we are privileged as Americans to have this and to have it so much baked into our thinking that even I didn't recognize this. Um, and I can, I can tell you a story like of how I realized this. Uh, my, my question before I tell my story is basically the one that Ben poses in the chats. I'm very curious to hear um, if, if there's time for it examples of things people think they don't do uh, because of the absence of fair use in their environments. But it, around 2015, I was invited to help participate in designing something called brightstatements.org. So this is a tool, it's still online. There are resources regarding um, ways of describing rights in cultural heritage collections. Uh, the planning group uh, included people from the United States and people from Europeana. And we got together to have this initial conversation. A lot of the people, particularly from Europe, were very involved in um, forming Creative Commons. And there was a lot of discussion about how these were not licenses that we were envisaging. These were descriptions. And that made a lot of sense. And uh, at some point, you know, for 20 years, I've been doing digital collections by then. This is 2015 and saying, we put on a, a notice online and still most of our notices say something like, we're making this available for educational scholarly purposes, basically that list of fair use type uses. Um, uh, if you're gonna make another use, you need to make your own uh, decision about the rights. So we still do that. But that positioning in my thinking coming from the nineties was, hey, I'm part of an institution that wants to make the collection available. By the, by the 20 teens, the issue was not just making it available. It's like, what can your audience do with the stuff? And in talking with our European colleagues, it is so obvious, but it just didn't, it didn't really consciously dawn on me that the way European handles their, their aggregator that is that participants have to either say, identify materials uh, as being in the public domain or as being licensed. Uh, th because there's no fair use, there's this, uh, there's a certain rigidity. Now, the good thing is, if you're using a Europeana aggregator, you know what you can do, presumably. Um, I think you know what you can do. With an American collection, we have huge volumes, even for adjusting for sizes of population and so forth. There are a huge number of digital collections, all available with the wonderful chaos that fair use allows for, but we couldn't do it. We wouldn't have the richness of the material, even if it's not as interoperable as we might like in certain ways. Um, we wouldn't have, we, we would have a very different situation. So we can't always tell someone what to do. Um, and I wish I've, since that time have factored that into my thinking I still can't always tell someone what they can do. Um, but I do try to think about the use and the reuse a lot more than just the my organization making the thing available. Um, Thank you. And I think that, that's actually, it, it, it's a really interesting point. And uh, Derek may come, come to this as well, but also this move away that obviously it, it's also something that libraries in general are looking more at is away from sort of simple consumption of what you find in the collections and actually considering that everyone is both a consumer and a creator and it's not the simple very one way produce consume relationship and fair use offering a way of actually addressing this and addressing this this legally rather than just being tied down to this extremely sort of passive almost patronizing approach melissa your hands up <laughs> responding to that um I think the whole field of digital scholarship and digital humanities um, uh, is entirely dependent on, on this kind of um, 
opportunity and and uh, I just I just wanted to add that. Derek, sorry, I, I hope I didn't sure. say what you wanted to say. Oh, no worries. No, that's uh, that's um, I'll. To answer your question, I mean, I think that the short answer is no, of course not. <laughs> these things wouldn't be possible. A lot of these uses wouldn't be possible unless they're covered by some other specific clear bright line exception. In many cases they're not. I think the other thing, you know, in the US context to weigh in here is statutory damages. So, like, you know, if you are on the hook for, um, and then it's, you know, it's part of the challenge right now with, I think, fair use would be that much more helpful if the statutory damages system was reformed so that you weren't sort of in the position of, well, I'm making a copy of these millions of things. So my damages are either zero or at a maximum like millions times $125,000, right? That, it's a big range to deal with. Um, so the threat of statutory damages still has a massive chilling effect, I think, in the US over what's possible. Um, and so the system overall can still be improved, but yeah, I mean, it, without, without that safety valve, um, you can think of the alternative paths. So one is more defined, explicit exceptions. Sure. But that you can't imagine every new use, um, that just wouldn't be, that, that's not, that's not feasible. That's the, by definition, some things are not yet imagined. Um, one could also imagine, you know, more systems that are. Uh, so you can imagine personal copy acceptance matched with levies of various sorts. And, you know, that's something that has that has been deployed in various regimes. I think it can be unnecessary, cumbersome, and sometimes quite chilling of um, real use and innovation. See the digital audio tape where that was a system uh, created in late 80s, early 90s. Um, there was a speci specific personal copying exception and levy system created in the U.S. under the Audio Home Recording Act, and that technology went absolutely nowhere. Um, nobody bought it, and that was one, you know, it was one among many reasons that it was more expensive and more cumbersome, and with its copying restrictions. Um, but I, you know, I don't think that should be left out. So you know, I think always having that mix of clear, bright lines and a flexible safety valve is the is the optimal, and that's where. You know, it's not it's it's not an either or. Um, I think it's a both and. Well, thank you, and I, I think that actually brings us. I, I wanted to sort of give give um, the question from Ben in the chat sort of proper attention because I, I think and this is something that that, that that Sarah talked about a little bit. And one of the common arguments that we hear against fair use um, is is the risk that it sort of triggers some sort of existential crisis. Um, that because there isn't someone telling you very firmly what it is that you can do or not, that it, it becomes, I don't know, that, that life becomes incredibly stressful and, and, and life becomes extremely sort of difficult and people don't really know what to do. Um, what's your sense that, that this lack of specificity, I know I, you've raised this all, you've all raised this a little bit, but the sense, yeah. does this- you know, I can try and touch that one, like yeah, just perfect. from the- perspective of building things. The only thing more stressful than um, the uncertainty of fair use when you're building something is a bright line that you can't go build something. <laughs> right? Like if you wanna go build, try and build some new productive, transform, socially beneficial tool, and there's just a bright line ban on it, that's pretty, I'd say that's more stressful. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think again, fair use plus statutory damages is not optimal, the sort of the saying of fair use is just your right to hire a lawyer. Not not perfect, but I, I'd rather have that than a closed system and just a closed system of exceptions. Thank you, Melissa. I'm, I'm giving really pragmatic, like really on the ground kinds of examples. And Derek's comment regarding innovation is that for a number of years, we were seeing at a few of the uh, engineering programs, particularly, um, that really were encouraging entrepreneurship and innovation, you know, technical innovation along with the entrepreneurship pieces. There were a number of examples of students starting businesses to produce, sell, produce apps that um, were contrary to the law in a privacy sense or copyright. Like it's a really good idea. And they were very naive in 
um, the, the lack of, they didn't hire a lawyer. And um, uh, so there were, there, were, there were efforts to get in touch with these, these students um, to either pull them back and help them get the, the rights that they, the, the advice that they needed and keep them out of trouble. Um, uh, I think this eluded a bit with the growth of entrepreneurship classes in engineering and computer science programs. So there's the innovation is going to bust out no matter what the law is. The problem is we in part don't want those um, maybe sometimes, you know, like when you're invading privacy in order to do something that you think is really helpful, that might be something to pause on. Um, but uh, I just wanted to share that anecdote. No, th thank you. No, it's, a bit, no, it, it, it's appreciated. And also that these, these it, it, it helps make things a lot less theoretical. And, and I, I know it's, a, uh, it's not the first time I've said it in this way, but often discussions about copyright get very sort of theological. And so actually being able to dive into the practical and, and, and explain exactly what's happening is, is super helpful. Did, did you want to add anything, Sarah, on the, the question of the sort of the existential crisis? I think, I think it was covered pretty well. Great, so the next question I, I, I wanted to actually ask is, is Another area that we, we focus on within Knowledge Rights 21 is the degree to which contracts risk taking away um, possibilities that are granted, and in particular, do contracts risk actually undermining fair use? It would be uh, appreciate hearing a little bit about your sense of how that, that works, and, and please feel free to touch on technological protection measures or DRM as well. Oh, I, I definitely think that contracts can start eating into a lot of different rights that we have. And, you know, one of the big controversies going on in the United States, and I know in Europe as well, is with the ebook licensing and how libraries not only are don't own anything because they are licensing these books, but they also don't have some of the rights that we have under the copyright law, including, you know, interlibrary loan and different um you know, and fair uses, right? If if the contract does not allow you to use part of the book, um, then you can't you can't access it, you can't download it, you can't make a copy of it, et cetera, et cetera. And so um I know one issue that um the American Library Association and the Association for Research Libraries has been looking at is that issue of contract override and can we um make some movement towards um, preserving some of these rights that we have, Section 108 and fair use um, against contract um, restrictions. And, you know, one thing that I consistently tell librarians is to be sure to reserve all rights and exceptions that we have in copyright law, um, in any type of library licensing, because otherwise it's it's waived. Um, and I think that is easier said than done <laughs> because you can ask, but if you have very little negotiating power, um, and especially with public libraries, you're seeing that, you know, the demand for eBooks is very, very high. Um, and if the, um, if the license is a kind of take it or leave it license, then you're, you're just dealing with the vitriol of your patrons and they really are just trying to access um, knowledge and you're just trying to provide that access. So it's a, it's a very difficult situation and uh, they've tried to deal with it through some legislation um, and have had limited success. So it's uh, something that we are actively talking about and trying to make movement on. Thank you. And then I suppose at least the argument here is that obviously there's a similar issue within Europe and starting from a, a probably less knowledge and use friendly point that even those more limited rights also obviously get, get sort of signed away. And it's also a, a powerful point that actually by not including contract override provisions, we risk going backwards. It's not a case of, I don't know, it's not a case of stopping major advances or anything like that. It is a, a risk of actually having 
some of the even relatively limited possibilities libraries have clawed away. Um, Melissa, Derek, did you want to add anything? Oh, Melissa? I guess I did. Um, you know, on the subject of these contracts, both in Europe and the United States, um, some of the people working for with libraries that are handling these things are extremely sophisticated. And some of them are really good librarians. And they're in these negotiations over very large amounts of money, especially over a career um, that might benefit from having either a, a procurement person who really knows the nature of the, the product and the service or uh, someone who's there either as a, a trained negotiator or trained, it, it could be an attorney, it's not necessarily. But I think it's very hard um, as a cultural issue um, to place even very senior librarians in these positions with um, companies that have people who are trained professional uh, negotiators and salespeople. Uh, absolutely, and, uh, American libraries in general tend to be bigger and often better stuff than European equivalents. So it's even arguably an even greater risk within Europe. Derek, did you want to? Yeah, on you know, protect, technological protection measures and contracts, I think, yeah, it is um, one of the most worrisome transformations that's happened in the last 25 years. And it, you know, to zoom back come from a user perspective, we're essentially talking about the end of ownership. That I no longer can buy and own goods. Now, it's not to say, I, I look, I'm a Netflix subscriber. I get plenty of benefits from subscription services too. Um, but it, you know, there also is a real problem when ebook vendors are selling works, they have a buy this button, which suggests that a user is owning the thing that they are getting. And then they only can read that thing on a particular hardware device. And the way that then um, the creators of the media can dictate what happens in downstream or upstream, you're looking at hardware and service markets. Um, that's something we wouldn't tolerate like you know, with electricity, like imagine you worked with PG&E and you could only use light bulbs that were PG&E approved, that they sold and so our TVs that they sold, right? Um, that, that would be a much more closed market. It means that uh, I think the sort of, again, the sort of disruptive innovation wouldn't come about because those incumbents have both don't have the incentive to foster it, but in fact have, dis have incentives to shunt it, to try and stamp it out because it might corrode existing markets. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad that, um, you know, I think we still need to think about how over time do we peel back the reach of those laws, but I think it's, it's sort of an up, it's a very uphill battle at this point. Yeah, and, and it, 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 exactly, unfortunately, that's one of those areas where we are beginning to see some progress in Europe, at least around certain limitations and exceptions where it's not possible for contracts to override, but this is also a question we're looking at more, more broadly with um, under KR21. Um, we've come to the end of our time. I, I was just going to say before thanking our speakers and just doing a little bit about um, how our participants can get involved with KR21. I think I, I want, there was a four things that I noticed, I noticed a fair use as, as being from, from, from in terms of what was said. I think the first one was a point to really clearly made by Melissa and Derek that this is an economic policy. It is a decision to favour the future, a decision to favour competitiveness and um, more open markets in future. So, and it's something that I, know, I felt was being recommended and in that sense would be recommended for Europe that actually cares about its competitiveness and compares about, cares about its ability to generate new businesses and, 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 and new ideas. I got down that fair use was a safety valve, um, a way of dealing with dynamism, a way of actually allowing the US to be directly already addressing some of these questions around uh, around e-lending, around, um, around controlled digital lending, around um, AI in a way that in Europe we just have to wait until there's enough space on the legislative train schedule to do so. So the fact you're actually already doing this gives an indication of one of the, the, the merits of this. Um, as a foundation for scholarship, I think Melissa's point about you can't, you couldn't imagine modern humanities. You definitely couldn't imagine digital humanities without a fair use type approach is a is a really powerful point. And then I think finally that it's a guarantor of, of rights. So it's not just an economic thing, but 
it's a way of making sure that education and research can simply happen today, that it doesn't get stuck in the past and, and we're not trying to do 19th century research and 19th century education in the 21st century. So with that, I wanted to say thank you very much to, to all of our speakers, to Sarah, to Melissa, to Derek. We will post the recording of the session up on the Knowledge Rights 21, um, Knowledge Rights 21 YouTube channel um, as soon as I can make it work. Um, I was simply going to say, um, finally, to, to, to share a few ideas with um, participants about ways you can get involved in our programme as a whole. Um, do take a look at our website. In a lot of European countries, we now have national coordinators. If you're interested in thinking about spreading the word and having a more sensible debate about fair use within Europe, about flexible norms within Europe than we often have, take a look, see if there's someone you can work with. Um, we'll be shortly be publishing work, including about open norms led by SIPM, the University of Bournemouth. Keep an eye on our website for that. That will hopefully provide evidence, that will provide evidence about experience, about why fair use has been introduced, what was the logic, what the impact has been. And then do keep an eye on what's going on on our website. Do um, on our website. Do email us if you want to be included on our mailing list. So with that, I want to say simply thank you to everyone. Thank you in particular to Sarah to Mr. Derek for and really great interventions, really digging down into what actually fair use means in reality, going beyond the hype, going beyond the hysteria. It's really appreciated. And thank you to everyone for joining us today on this call. So with that, I um. With that, I want to wish everyone a very good weekend when you get to it and hopefully look forward to working with you all soon. Thank you.